Hello, everyone. Welcome to this meeting uh, from the Historic Districts Council. My name is Diego Roballo, and I work for HDC. And uh, thank you for joining. So this is uh, an initiative that we've been carrying out in Upper Manhattan to promote preservation events and invite people, residents from Upper Manhattan to learn more about the history of, of that area uh, of the city. And for today's event, we have uh, Gregory Dietrich. Uh, Gregory is going to be talking about the Morningside Heights Historic District. Uh, he's a preservation consultant. He's a board member of HDC and um, Thank you so much, Gregory, for, for joining and sharing your knowledge with us. And if you have any questions, please type them uh, on the chat and I'll be happy to, to read them. Thank you. So feel free to share your screen, Gregory. Sure. Thank you, Diego. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be here, albeit remotely. Uh, to talk about Morningside Heights history and its advocacy efforts to secure local designation of its historic buildings. I'm a longtime resident of the Heights, having moved here over 25 years ago. And during that time, I went to grad school, uh, became a preservation consultant, and got involved as an advisor to the Morningside Heights Historic District Committee. I'm also a longtime board member of HDC as uh, Diego noted, having been involved with that organization since 2007. Well, um, preservation advocacy is certainly not for the faint of heart, <laughs> as evinced by a 21-year effort leading to the designation of Morningside Heights' first historic district in 2017. What you see here are district proposals going back to 1996, by Columbia University's Historic Preservation Studio, the Morningside Heights Historic District Committee, New York Assemblyman Daniel O'Donnell, and a counter proposal by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission that the community ultimately rejected. Along the way, the publication of Andrew Dolcart's monumental book on Morningside Heights development in 1998 and a variety of determinations by the New York State Historic Preservation Office regarding National Register eligibility bolstered the community's local designation efforts. So 2017 was a banner year for preservation in the Heights, signaled by the Landmarks Commission's designation of the Cathedral Close of St. John the Divine and Morningside Heights First Historic District. Having revisited its previous proposal, the commission expanded its boundaries eastward to encompass more buildings on the side streets. That is the side streets off of Riverside Drive, which you, you can see on the left uh, forms the spine of the district. And southward to link to the West End Avenue Historic District Extension. Um, in addition, they also brought in a substantial part of Cathedral Parkway that is largely the blocks between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenue, which um, interesting, were not, interestingly enough, were not in our original proposals. So we were thrilled by that. While we were encouraged by this expansion, uh, we were also mindful of the fact that there was so much more to consider in terms of this neighborhood's historic resources. So essentially tonight, I'm here to introduce you to our proposal for five mini districts. Um, but before I do that, I did want to touch on the early history of the neighborhood to give you some context. So I think many people know that um, you know, the Isle of Manhattan was originally settled by the Lenni Lenape uh, tribe. Um, in terms of colonial settlement under British rule, in uh, 1686, Governor Thomas Dongan granted a patent to the mayor, alderman, and commonality of the city of New York for a large triangular parcel extending from roughly West 107th to West 124th Streets between the Hudson River and the Harlem boundary uh, that included Morningside Heights. Around 1785, this tract was purchased by Nicholas and James W. de Peister, located on a high plateau bordered by rugged cliffs that separated it from Harlem to the east 
and the Hudson River to the west, Morningside Heights was not easily accessible from the rest of the city until the completion of the Bloomingdale Road in 1703. Nicholas de Peister, who purchased the tract within the southern portion of Morningside Heights, built his country estate on the ridge overlooking the Hudson around west 114th Street. To the east, the tract purchased by James W. de Peister remained vacant. So what you see here is uh, the old Bloomingdale Road as it extended south, uh, north to south. Uh, and then later, of course, we get Broadway. Um, and then here is Nicholas de Peister's mansion. And you can see just, you know, how probably breathtaking that view was with sort of the more open vistas uh, along the Hudson at that time. Uh, and then this is James's uh, property to the east here. And this, is, of course, shows a lot of the uh, property ownership during the time, which uh, has some rather irregular property boundaries, of course, owing to um, pre-1811 commissioner's plan, which introduces the grid to the city. In 1816, the Society of New York Hospital began purchasing land in Central Morningside Heights from James de Peister's son for the purposes of erecting a hospital for the care and treatment of mental patients. And in 1821, opened the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum on what is now the main campus of Columbia University. A second institution, the newly formed Leak and Watts Orphan Asylum, purchased part of the Society of New York Hospital's land holding south of West 113th and east of Amsterdam Avenue in 1834. Work started in 1837 on the orphanage's first building, and it was open for occupancy in 1843. The presence of these two institutions on large parcels of land, as well as the topography and lack of public transportation, impacted the extent of residential development on Morningside Heights throughout the 19th century. For much of the 18th and 19th centuries, the only overland access to Morningside Heights was the Bloomingdale Road which featured a stage line starting in 1819 that extended to Manhattanville to the north of Morningside Heights in 1823. Blocks within North uh, in the Heights were divided into parcels and lots by the heirs of Nicholas de Peister as early as the 1820s, consistent with the commissioner's plan of 1811. But most of this land was held by investors with development in the Heights largely limited to a handful of mansions overlooking the river and a concentration of small wood frame dwellings on West 110th Street that came to be known as Dixonville after their builder, William Dixon. So um, this, as everyone probably has guessed, is the campus of Columbia today, but this was originally the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum. And you can see the footprints of the buildings. Um, the main building standing um, largely in the area where Low Library sits. And then here we have what we know today as the site of the Cathedral Close of St. John the Divine. Um, but predating that was the Leakin Watts Orphan Asylum. And uh, remarkably, parts of this building still remain um, on the close. And then uh, here along the Hudson, we can see these scattered mansions that were developed um, before and during this time. And then here is this wood frame community along West 110th Street at this cluster of Broadway, which then was 11th Avenue, um, known as Dixonville. So we had this kind of uh, very early sort of commercial corridor that was developed during this time. The introduction of the subway into Morningside Heights in 1904 was largely responsible for the proliferation a speculative multifamily middle-class residential developments that occurred over the next seven years. However, as early as 1886, the Leakin Watts Orphan Asylum had sold its property to the Cathedral Committee for the construction of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. To the west of Amsterdam Avenue, real estate investors had already begun to, a campaign to force the Bloomingdale Asylum to vacate the area, maintaining that its presence depressed real estate values. After failed attempts to get, to get the state of New York to revoke the asylum's tax, ex, tax exempt status and to have it discredited, the asylum's board of uh, governors announced its plans to relocate the asylum from Morningside Heights to White Plains 
in May of 1888. The following year, the Board of Governors auctioned off 98 lots between Amsterdam Avenue and Broadway and West 112th and 14th Streets. In 1892, Teachers College, Columbia College, and St. Luke's Hospital acquired sizable tracts of land from the Board of Governors with the intent of relocating their campuses from Greenwich Village in Midtown to Morningside Heights. This concentrated wave of institutional development during the last decade of the 19th century would encourage other institutions to follow suit in the early 20th century, drawn to an area that still boasted sizable tracts of vacant land for campus development. So you can see uh, really a neighborhood that is largely undeveloped at this time in 1891 uh, with these two very prominent institutions sort of dominating it. Um, I also want to just speak to the fact that uh, there was, you know, one sort of quote unquote mass transit at that time, which was the Ninth Avenue elevated train, um, which prior to 1904 had run along Columbus Avenue or Ninth Avenue. But when it came to 110th Street, it veered east because of Morningside Park and followed the line of first um, Morning, uh, Manhattan Avenue, uh, then Morningside Avenue northward with a station that was located approximately at uh, 116th Street. So I just realized that I skipped a slide. <laughs> oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, I wanted to talk about, I'm gonna go back just ever so slightly uh, and talk about this particular map, which now you've gotten what happened after this. But in 1865, I wanted to speak to the parks. Um, the New York City Park Commissioner, William Martin, proposed a park and an adjacent road along Hudson River North 72nd Street. And this was the impetus for Riverside Park, which Frederick Law Olmsted designed between 1873 and 1875 and was constructed between 1875 and 1880, with later improvements during the 1930s. In 1868, recognizing the undevelopable tr um, tract of land located north of West 110th Street between 9th and 10th Avenues, which I was just talking about, Commissioner Andrew Haswell Green recommended the introduction of a park that would become Morningside Park. And this too, of course, was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, working with Calvert Box, initially in 1873 and revised in 1887 with construction spanning 1883 to 1895. In 1868, Broadway was introduced between West 70, 59th and 155th Streets, replacing Bloomingdale Road as the main thoroughfare passing through the neighborhood. However, development was hampered by the Heights rocky outcroppings and uneven terrain. Also, it was hampered by its distance from Fifth Avenue, which really was the hub of commercial and residential uh, development at that time. Uh, also, it was hampered by the exorbitant prices demanded by real estate speculators and a reluctance from developers to build in a new, nearly vacant area whose social composition had not yet been established. In 1879, the Ninth Avenue elevated train was completed to West 155th Street and contributed to the increased phase of development of the Upper West Side and Harlem. However, as I just noted, Morningside Heights was bypassed by the Ells Route north of 110th Street, shifting away from 9th Avenue to 8th Avenue. The beginning of the 1890s um, witnessed the first examples of row house construction in Morningside Heights. However, unlike the Upper West Side in Harlem, whose residential districts already boasted access to mass transportation and local commerce by the night, late 19th century, Morningside Heights was in the process of becoming a district of large scale institutions lacking basic amenities. As a result, a few of the real estate developers who were early investors in row house construction in the neighborhood went into foreclosure two years after construction due to a lack of sales. However, once plans for the subway were made public, investors and developers alike 
rejected the single family housing model in favor of acquiring multiple lots to build multifamily dwellings. As speculative row house development defined select blocks within the southern part of the neighborhood, French flats and tenements were being introduced within the northern part during the same period. So uh, French flats were early apartment houses that were marketed to the middle class um, renters during the mid to late 19th century that essentially helped normalize the idea of communal living for the middle class. And the Stuyvesant apartments that you see here in the lower right, uh, designed and constructed between 1869 and 1870, was considered the first middle class apartment house in New York City and based on the Parisian model. So this was designed by Richard Morris Hunt, who was the first American architect to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris and located at 142 East 18th Street. This building featured a total of 16 apartments, uh, numbering two per floor, along with four artist studios in the attic story, fully equipped bathrooms in each unit, street facing parlors, uh, bedrooms, dining rooms, kitchens in the rear, and separate entrances for residents and servants. The New York City Department of Buildings classified the Stuyvesant Apartments as both a first class dwelling and a Parisian dwelling. And this new type of middle-class housing eventually became known as French flats. So as not to be confused with tenements, boarding houses, hotels, and luxury apartment houses. An early horse-drawn streetcar running up Amsterdam Avenue spurred two different types of tenements being constructed in the northern part of the neighborhood by the late 19th century. Old law tenements and new law tenements. Old law tenements had to adhere to the Tenement Reform Act of 1879 and were built on either 25 foot wide or 50 foot wide lots in dumbbell plans that featured narrow window shafts between abutting tenements. The narrower tenements featured a single unit per floor, while the wider tenements featured two unit units per floor, along with shared bathrooms among multiple tenants. New law tenements had to adhere to the Tenement Reform Act of 1901 and were built on 50 foot wide lots in dumbbell plans, dumbbell plans with interior courtyards and at least one bathroom per unit. Uh, and as you can see, I'm giving you an example here of the old lot tenements. And you can just see how narrow these light wells were. Um, and just imagining that these are four apartments to a floor here, and yet look how limited the light is. Um, in terms of natural light, and then you've got these very limited exposure uh, light shafts here. The most prominent type of multifamily dwelling was the apartment house, which was targeted to the middle class. And among apartment houses in Morningside Heights, there was a hierarchy commensurate with the streets on which the buildings were located, with the most exclusive buildings located along Riverside Drive with its sweeping panoramas of the Hudson River, and Broadway with its immediate access to mass transit and commercial amenities. And the less exclusive buildings located along Amsterdam Avenue, Morningside Drive, and the cross streets. These latter developments targeted lower and solidly middle-class renters with the six-story elevator apartment house quickly becoming the ubiquitous housing type in the Heights. On the one hand, satisfying renter demands for um, the most recent you know, apartment amenities, as well as natural lights and elevators, and on the other hand, satisfying developer demands for cheaper construction alternatives, which only allowed for semi-fireproof construction on apartment buildings up to six stories. So for these apartment house developers, this was really um, a more economical form of development since they didn't have to conform to the full uh, fireproof laws of the time. The introduction of the subway into Morningside Heights not only resulted in a variety of speculative multifamily residential development, but also in an architectural cohesion that largely reflected a new vernacular architecture born out of the me melding of two popular yet disparate styles, Italian Renaissance Revival and Colonial Revival. Although it's unclear as to the precedent for this melding of styles, National events such as the Centennial Exposition of 1876 in Philadelphia and the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 in Chicago would have exerted a substantial influence in promoting colonial revival 
and Renaissance Revival architecture to the country at large. Apart from these national architectural showcases, New York City had its own history of design to look to for precedent. For example, uh, Georgian and federal architecture have been integral to its development as manifested in standalone houses such as the Georgian-inspired Morris Jamel Mansion in Washington Heights, and a preponderance of federal-style row houses and townhouses, such as the Edward Mooney House dating to 1789 in the Bowery, and others that permeated the neighborhoods of Lower Manhattan and the East and West Villages. By the turn of the 20th century, the stylistic and material hallmarks of federal and Georgian-style architecture would be integrated into a period revival style known as colonial revival style. Similarly, the city's Italian architecture had precedent in the mid 19th century palazzo style store and loft buildings and showrooms of Tribeca and the mid to late 19th century cast iron commercial buildings of Soho. Similarly, the style also found expression in the row houses, townhouses and mansions found in select neighborhoods of Manhattan and West Brooklyn. So Andrew Dolkart, who I mentioned uh, is the author of Morningside Heights, a history of its architecture and development, suggested that McKim, Mead, and White's Columbia University classroom buildings, with their unorthodox combination of Italian Renaissance and colonial inspired elements beginning in the late 19th century, may have influenced a range of residential buildings in the neighborhood. Among the Renaissance inspired um, elements found on these early classroom buildings, are these rusticated and radiated, radiating limestone bases. Um, rustication refers to sort of the routing that you find along the bases that give it the block-like appearance. Um, another aspect was the, um, well, the, the use of the buff brick and then also the classically inspired uh, portico, which unfortunately I don't have a really good uh, example here, but which is so prevalent on the apartment houses throughout Morningside Heights, uh, which uh, fe feature a classically inspired portico su supported by columns with, uh, uh, you know, Ionic or Corinthian capitals under an entablature that often boasts the name of the building in bas relief. We also have examples of the um, Georgian revival style with the coins that you see, which are these block-like elements uh, that run the, up the corners of the building. And then in terms of the colonial revival influence, we have the use of the red brick often laid in Flemish bond. Uh, Flemish bond is essentially the long side of the brick alternating with the short side of the brick with the short side often um, featuring um, a coal black color known as a burnt header, which uh, sometimes can give the building sort of a confetti sort of look. Uh, in addition, other colonial elements that you see uh, both at Columbia and in the Heights are these uh, splayed and keyed lintels. Uh, uh, splayed, of course, referring to the outward projection of the ends and the keys being the central element, the keystone, essentially. Uh, those are, are hallmarks of the federal style. So uh, Lamb and Rich's Millbank Hall at Barnard College, which you see on the lower right here, with its Renaissance-inspired coins and cornice, combined with its colonial-inspired red brick walls and keyed and splayed lintels, uh, really does appear as if it served as a template uh, for so many of the residential buildings that were to come in the Heights. Uh, just after these buildings completion. Although not as prevalent, uh, other popular styles of the late 19th and early 20th centuries inform the proposed district's architecture that includes Beaux-Arts, often distinguished by limestone and or white brick with French and Italian Baroque ornamentation, uh, arts and crafts, often incorporating ornamental brickwork and tile, Tudor revival, evoking half-timbered construction through brick and stone, label moldings and angled orioles, secessionists characterized by classically and geometrically inspired ornamentation, Art Nouveau distinguished by art organic forms and ornamentation, as well as French Renaissance revival and Neo-Romanesque. 
So now I'm going to talk about the five proposed mini districts that um, the Morningside Historic District District Committee has put forth uh, and is engaging in a dialogue currently with the Landmarks Commission about. So the first one is the proposed Morningside Heights Historic District Extension, which you see bounded in blue and um, is meant to build off of the existing historic district that was designated in 2017. Um, this extension reflects two successive waves of speculative development that is single family and multifamily dwelling construction and roughly bounded by Amsterdam and Broadway and West 112th and 114th streets. So it bears noting that once the Bloomingdale Asylums Board of Governors decided to auction off its land, uh, it was not willing to risk the possibility of quote, letting the market decide what would get built. And instead it imposed restrictive covenants on the 98 lots that it auctioned off in 1889. So as to ensure that its property values would be maintained. And in doing so, attempt to emulate the successes found on the Upper West Side's fashionable West End to the South and Harlem to the, to the east. Thus, the developments on West 112th to 114th streets between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenue reflect the earliest restrictive covenants in the neighborhood, specifying no noxious uses, uh, minimum building heights of four stories, and materials consisting of brick or stone for walls and slate, tin, or some other type of fireproof material for roofs. These two blocks boast the highest concentration of row houses in Morningside Heights when developers sought to replicate the successes of the Upper West Side to the South and Harlem to the Northeast. And um, for those of you who don't know, this is an individual landmark in the Heights. It's our local fire station, which um, nicely connects to the proposed district that we're looking at here. And then you get a sense of uh, some of the row houses uh, here, some along West 114th Street, and then really sort of the heterogeneous um, development of apartment houses uh, on and tenements, uh, really situated cheap by jowl on this street. The proposed historic district extension features several distinct multifamily dwellings. For example, the Phaeton at 539 West 112th Street was designed by George and Edward Blum in 1909 and was influenced by contemporary progressive French housing. This uh, building was critically praised by the architectural record and the real estate record and builder's guide for its aesthetics, which incorporated arts and crafts inspired brick, tile, and metal work. And I should say that I don't think that my photos do it justice. Uh, you really do need to, to visit this building and see for yourself really the intricate uh, artisanship that's going on with respect to these, the use of these materials. Other notable buildings include a tenement building known as the Kiltanga, located at 540 West 112th Street, which was designed by Neville and Bagg in 1903 and executed in a restrained yet elegant Renaissance Revival style that also incorporates colonial revival elements. Architect George Miller's six-story apartment house at 512 West 112th Street dates to 1930, so it's really a very late example of a building by height standards. Um, and it is a distinct example of a neo-Romanesque um, designed building with its use of cream colored brick and its judicious application of ornamentation. Along West 113th Street, the eight story Rensselaer apartment building at 536 West 113th Street was designed by the prolific firm of Neville and Bagg in 1909. And uh, to my mind offers one of the best examples of a mid block apartment house designed in the Beaux-Arts style of anywhere in the Heights with its gleaming white limestone facade, alternating with a full height copper oriole and a Baroque inspired base and uppermost story. Um, for those of you not familiar with the term, uh, the oriole is similar to a bay, except that it doesn't touch the ground, whereas a bay does. Uh, so an oriole really uh, cantilevers uh, over, over the uh, building. In addition, many of the row houses in the proposed Morningside Heights Historic District Extension were acquired by Columbia University fraternities and sororities, mostly throughout the 20th century. 
thereby indelibly linking them to the cultural life of the university. These include Sigma Nu Fraternity, located at 556 West 113th Street, Kappa Alpha Theta Sorority, located at 534 West 114th Street, and Alpha Delta Phi Society, founded in 1836 and located at 526 West 114th Street, among many other row houses uh, located on these two cross streets. And this one, Alpha, Alpha Delta Phi, is actually a redo of the row houses. You can see the similar um, mid-story and base, and then the addition of this story here with this very interesting sort of Dutch Renaissance revival um, roof line. So that brings us to the second proposal. Um, that is the proposed Amsterdam Avenue, Morningside Drive South, Historic District, which reflects a variety of speculative, mostly mid-rise, multifamily dwellings. This one is roughly bounded by Amsterdam Avenue and Morningside Drive and West 115th and 116th Streets. And you can see through these various photos um, the altogether cohesive character with respect to scale um, in this particular proposal. Um, largely characterized by this Renaissance revival with um, colonial revival elements informing their designs. So this proposed district offers an array of mid-rise multifamily dwellings that are designed in the Renaissance revival style and incorporate uh, colonial revival elements, as I just noted. Um, one of the most distinct ensembles of early six-story elevator apartment buildings are Cathedral Court, uh, La Terraine, and Montserrat. All three of these buildings were commissioned by the Paterno brothers and designed by Schwartz and Gross, which working together and independently uh, exerted an enormous influence on the architectural character of Morningside Heights. These buildings are distinguished by their red brick laid in Flemish bond with burnt headers and terracotta trim over rusticated limestone bases with detailing that includes alternating brick and terracotta bounding to evoke rustication. That is sort of this idea of blocks. Coins, which are those corner um, members that I mentioned earlier, those block-like members on the corners of these buildings, the keyed and splayed lintels over the windows, and bracketed metal cornices. In particular, Cathedral Court has a highly distinctive roof line consisting of alternating blind oculate and Athenian cresting over a medallion cornice, all constructed of terracotta. And I just wanted to point out uh, the blind oculi, ocu, oculus, of course, refers to eye, blind, meaning that it is uh, solid and not a void, as you would find you know, with a window, uh, which would just be considered an oculus. And then above the Anthemian cresting, that's the palmetto leaf that you see here, this really wonderful uh, character-defining feature of this building. Also, just note that you see the recessed uh, balconies here uh, excuse me, recessed fire escapes that were marketed as Parisian balconies uh, to the various renters. So the one in the lower right um, was a institutional residence that originally served as a nurse's dormitory for St. Luke's Hospital, originally known as Sesrin Hall, which is nurses spelled backward. Um, it was designed by Neville and Bagg in 1906 and characterized by an imposing Renaissance revival design. And um, I had uh, Andrew Dolcard as one of my professors in grad school. And one thing that he would constantly say uh, when we were out on our walks, like surveying a particular neighborhood, was to really look at the building. And I mean, that just sounds so straightforward and um, count, you know, intuitive. However, I think many of us every day pass by buildings without really looking at the buildings. And Sesterin Hall is one of these buildings that has, well, you know, like I said, I've been in the Heights since 95 and only really, really recently came to appreciate just the extent of architectural um, detailing that's going on in this building, including on the ground floor 
original stained glass windows that remarkably are still intact. This building also has a, just a marvelous cultural uh, social history as well, uh, where it, it has uh, the press association for a while um, and um, also uh, currently acts as a dormitory for the law, uh, the law school at Columbia. The third proposal is the proposed Amsterdam Avenue Morningside Drive North Historic District, which reflects a variety of speculative multifamily dwellings that encompass mid and high rise buildings. This one is roughly bounded by Amsterdam Avenue, West 118th Street and Morningside Drive. Again, you can see this um, architectural character largely informed by the Renaissance Revival along with these colonial revival um, motifs. And many of them also uh, apparently, you know, um, comprised of this buff brick, which I think looks a little dull today. Uh, many of these buildings could use a good cleaning. <laughs> Here we have some more um, showing a little bit variety with respect to the scale of the buildings. Um, this is unfortunate. Over here, we have a new development known as the Mark, the Monarch, um, which is a 13-story uh, condominium that's designed in the Buddha style. Uh, it's a real out of context new development, which is what has been really propelling the Morningside Heights Historic District Committee to advocate for these buildings protection. Um, it replaced a former boarding house uh, for uh, single women that were uh, working, forgot what industry, um, but again, interesting social history, but in, at the end was not something that necessarily rose to the level of an individual landmark, but certainly as part of this larger district uh, did. So as I said, numerous buildings in this proposal uh, are designed in this Renaissance revival incorporating colonial revival elements. In addition, the Edmund Francis at 423 West 120th Street, designed by George F. Pelham, um, was completed in 1912 and offers a noteworthy counterpoint with its Renaissance revival design, augmented by imposing medieval inspired ornamentation and when you really look at this building, what you can appreciate is just how imposing this ornamentation is. Um, part of me says thank you, Local Law 11, for preserving pedestrian safety. And I, I do look in awe at this building um, because it, it truly looks like these things, if they ever fell off, <laughs> would, would be fatal. But they're, they're wonderful. Other buildings offer variations on the popular arts and crafts style, such as the secessionist inspired Palmetto at 100 Morningside Drive, also designed by the same architect, George F. Pelham, and dating to 1909, with its ornate roof line featuring prominent corner pilasters containing bell flowers crowned by orbs and terracotta panels and framing green and white tiles in a checkerboard pattern. And I'm sorry uh, you don't get sort of a larger view of this, but again, a uh, very fanciful roof line for a rather modest building. So that brings us to the fourth proposal. This is the Broadway Amsterdam Avenue Historic District, which reflects a district of predominantly working class multifamily dwellings, along with a small concentration of middle class multifamily dwellings and a discrete religious complex, uh, which is St. Mary's Church. It's roughly bounded by Broadway and Amsterdam and West 121st and 123rd Streets. So this proposal includes three five-story mixed-use old law tenement buildings at 1268-1272 Amsterdam Avenue, appended by a six-story mixed-use old law tenement building occupying a 25-foot wide lot at 1274 Amsterdam Avenue all designed by John Grant in 1898 when a horse-drawn streetcar traversed Amsterdam Avenue. These tenements adhere to the popular Renaissance Revival style of the period, while the remaining new law tenements in the proposed district 
adhere to this greater neighborhood-wide trend of Renaissance revival incorporating colonial revival detail. And so here you can see these old law tenements here, uh, which are remarkably intact as tenem tenements go with, um, uh, of course, changes to the storefronts, but even then so not so drastic as to compromise their ability to read as, as old law tenements. Uh, and then you can see the new law tenements, which are you know, quite colorful, especially with this use of the banding, the limestone alternating with the brick, um, the classically inspired portico that I referred to earlier, uh, which is a Renaissance revival um, motif. Um, then you've got the coining, the keyed and splayed lintels, and the classically inspired cornice. The south side of West 122nd Street, between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenue, offers one of the most distinctive rows of tenement buildings that include numbers 524 to 530 West 122nd Street, designed by Bernstein and Bernstein in 1906, which was a prolific designer of tenements, French flats, and apartment buildings on both the east and west sides of Manhattan. The earliest residential developments in the proposed Broadway Amsterdam Avenue Historic District, um, interestingly, were not the tenements, but instead these French flats that you can find at 520-530 West 123rd Street, designed by F.T. Camp in 1896, four of which were designed in an unconventional Tudor Revival style, and two of which were designed in the Renaissance Revival style. Moreover, both of these rows incorporate Romanesque detailing, albeit in different ways. So for example, numbers 520 to 526 feature decorative brickwork that includes diaper patterns, which are a diaper pattern brick is essentially the diamond uh, patterns that you see using different colored brick. And coins lining the bays uh, containing angled uh, metal orioles with flirtively detailing and Roman arches under meticulated roof lines. So the Roman arched, uh, arched windows are here, and the meticulated roof line is essentially this scalloped detail that you see along the roof line. Um, really quite inventive and unusual, not something you see of this sort of uh, cross uh, pollination, for lack of a better word, of, of styles. Uh, of course, uh, Andrew Dulcard famously said that most of the buildings that we see in New York City are vernacular. That is, they don't adhere to a particular style uh, completely, that there are these different stylistic elements that are often thrown in. The other part of these flats at uh, 528 West 530 Street, West 123rd Street, um, feature elegant porticos supported by Doric columns under bowed orioles accentuated by rough-faced brownstone lintels. Uh, so again, this is rather interesting to have this kind of um, the, the highbrow, you know, classically inspired portico uh, then contrasted with these rough-faced uh, lintels over the windows. Uh, it's just rather unusual. So it's sort of the earthy and the sublime together. Among the many tenements in the area is the wildly creative Bancroft, uh, designed by Emery Roth in 1910. Located at 509 West 121st Street, this architectural anomaly was originally built as the Setlow Apartments after the president of Columbia University. It features a wildly eclectic secessionist design with a Tuscan inspired roof line and is a little known gem by an architect who has been indelibly associated with no less than three iconic apartment houses that have come to define the Central Park West skyline. That's the San Remo, the Beresford, and El Dorado. And I should note that this is a building that you don't really have to look at. When you come to this building, you know it. Uh, it is just so eye-filling and interesting. Uh, I highly recommend for any of you who haven't visited uh, West 121st Street between Amsterdam and Broadway to check it out. 
So that brings us to uh, our last mini district proposal, which is the proposed Riverside Drive Claremont Avenue Historic District, which reflects a mix of working and middle-class multifamily dwellings. This one is roughly bounded by Riverside Drive and Claremont Avenue, West 122nd Street and Tiemann Place. Again, um, the six-story elevator apartment house, along with six-story new law tenements, uh, really divine, define the architectural cohesion that you find in this neighborhood. So this proposed district offers one of the most cohesive intact rows of new law tenement buildings of anywhere in the Heights. Located at 180-200 Claremont Avenue, this entire block front, which you see in the two photos below, uh, comprised eight tenement buildings designed by Neville and Bagg in 1905, and bear all the hallmarks of the neighborhood's juxtaposed Re Renaissance Revival and Colonial Revival styles. It bears noting that Neville and Bagg, together with George F. Pelham and Schwartz and Gross, were the three most prolific architectural firms working in Morningside Heights between the late 19th and early 20th century, with Neville and Bagg represented by 37 residential buildings, uh, George F. Pelham with 27, and Schwartz and Gross with 13. As such, these firms exerted an enormous influence over the architectural ambiance that makes the Heights so special. Directly across the street, two new law tenements at 189-191 Claremont Avenue, designed by Denby and Newt in 1905, which is the photo in, in the top, uh, created a harmonious counterpoint to Neville and Bagg's block front, executed in the Renaissance Revival style and incorporating both colonial revival and arts and crafts detailing that includes red brick with burnt headers laid in Flemish bond, heat and slate lintels, and decorative brickwork that includes prominent square and diamond motifs running along the top floor. This proposed district also features distinctive examples of the six-story elevator apartment house, such as 160 Claremont Avenue, designed by Maximilian Zipkus in 1911, with its eye-filling Art Nouveau-inspired design, incorporating polychromatic terracotta along its roof line. And I should say that this is uh, really a feast for the eyes as well when you see this in person. And the, the colors really stand out there. And, and also, um, similar to the Palmetto, that, that the base and the midsection of this building are really quite modest architecturally. Um, all the action is in the roof line. Along Riverside Drive, there's a row of Tudor inspired buildings ranging from the high style Ulysses at number 528. Uh, which is the upper left photo that I showed you in black and white earlier. This, and this was designed by Lafayette Goldstone in 1908 uh, to the more restrained Montebello designed by George Keister in 1906, who was the architect of the Apollo Theater and several Broadway houses. So in accordance with New York City Landmarks Law, uh, the five proposed historic districts are significant in the following areas. Special character that constitutes a distinct section of the city. Uh, that is for their harmonious juxtaposition of row houses, tenements, French flats, apartment houses, dormitories, apartment hotels, and boarding houses, ranging from four to 10 stories high and constructed during a peak period between 1896 and 1912 in a variety of styles, such as Renaissance Revival, Renaissance Revival incorporating Colonial Revival, Beaux-Arts, Arts and Crafts, Tudor Revival, Tudor Revival incorporating Romanesque Revival, and Secessionist, and special historical interests in the areas of architecture, for their association with three prolific architectural firms in Morningside Heights that included Neville and Bagg, George F. Pelham, and Schwartz and Gross, who together exerted an enormous influence on the architectural character of the neighborhood, and for their association with Emory Roth in the proposed Broadway Amsterdam Avenue and Riverside Drive Claremont Avenue Historic Districts, who is an acknowledged master in the field of architecture, 
and whose work has been recognized on the Upper East and West Sides of Manhattan for his significant contributions to the architecture of the apartment hotel and the apartment house. And also special historical interest in the areas of social history. For their association with the development of a middle-class neighborhood that was notable for having the highest density of middle-class housing built anywhere in the city within a limited amount of time. It's also significant in the area of social history for its West 113th and 114th Street row houses, historical association with Columbia University's fraternities and sororities, which offered early conversions of these single family houses into dormitory uses when market forces at the turn of the 20th century made them no longer viable and leading to their long-term association with the cultural life of the university that continues to this day. Also, the proposed districts are significant for their special aesthetic interest in the area of architecture. That is for their high concentration of vernacular multifamily dwellings, melding two popular yet disparate styles of the early 20th century. That is Italian Renaissance revival and colonial revival. And in doing so, emulating the architectural precedent set by their institutional counterparts, such as Columbia University and Barnard College. And finally, representative of one or more periods or styles of architecture, typical of one or more eras in the history of the city, for their embodiment of a single period of construction of roughly 16 years between 1896 and 1912, resulting in multiple styles such as Beaux-Arts, Arts and Crafts, and Tudor Revival, with the most dominant style reflecting Renaissance Revival with Colonial Revival elements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gregory. That was very informative and very interesting. And uh, if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Or if you want to type it on the chat, please feel free to do so. Uh, otherwise, I, I want to thank Gregory and everyone else for joining this wonderful meeting. Uh, as I said in the beginning, so this is a Historic Districts Council initiative to promote preservation in Upper Manhattan. And all the meetings that we do are recorded. So we're going to publish this meeting on our YouTube page and we'll be uploading it uh, soon. So make sure to check out our YouTube page or uh, also our website and yeah. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Diego. Thank you, thank everyone. You. That was great, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone, bye. Bye.